Colossians chapter number 1 this morning. I'm going to be bringing to you a message on hope. The hope of glory is going to be the title of this message. The hope of glory. Colossians chapter 1 verse 27. Let us all stand together if you will as we read this passage of scripture together. The Bible says, To whom God would make known what is the riches of the glory of this mystery among the Gentiles, which is Christ in you, the hope of glory. Let's pray. Lord, I thank you so much for this day and this opportunity again to gather together in your name and in your house. Lord, I know there's many people here who suffer and struggle from a lack of hope in their lives, Lord, and I pray that you'll speak to us this morning on our each individual level and our each individual circumstance that we will receive a message of hope from you this morning. Lord, whatever it is that you have for us, I pray that will be what is delivered today. Help us, Lord, to receive your message and help us be willing to follow in your ways. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Thank you. May be seated. The hope of Glory. I'll try not to be long. I want you to listen to my creeping, cracking voice uh, too long, but I want you to hear a message from God. I hope you've come to hear Him today and not me. Amen? I hope we've come to see God do something, not someone else. Amen? We need to come to church to see God. We've been doing a study in our Sunday school class called Living in the Real. And it's all about truly letting God be God in your life. Not making false realities and talking yourself into a comfort level of this and that dealer because of what we want. But we just need to let God truly have his way. And if we'll do that, we'll experience what I'm talking about this morning of the hope of glory. I want to read the verse to you one more time. To whom God would make known... I want you to look at how the verse is broke down. To whom God would make known. He said, whoever will allow this to become real to us in our lives. To whom God would make known what is the riches of the glory of this mystery among the Gentiles, which is Christ in you, the hope of glory. He's basically saying, if you'll just listen to me, if you'll just listen to the Word of God, if you'll just simply open yourself up to what is real in my name, you'll have hope in glory. That's what he's saying today. Paul has been called a mystery writer. The mystery of the time of the Gentiles. Romans chapter 11, verse 25 says, For I would not, brethren, that you should be ignorant of this mystery, lest ye should be wise in your own conceits, that blindness in part has happened to Israel until the fullness of the Gentiles is come in. Paul is writing to reveal many mysteries to us. He talks about mysteries a lot in the Bible. And it's amazing that God, as mysterious as he is, is as open as he is with us. There are no secrets with God. Maybe there's a lot of mystery, but there are no secrets. And Paul is writing. He's talking about uh, the mystery of the times of the Gentiles. He talks about the mystery of the age of grace. In Romans chapter 16, verse 25, he says, Now to him that is of power to establish you according to my gospel and the preaching of Jesus Christ, according to the revelation of the mystery which is kept secret since the world began. The secret or the mystery, rather, of the age of grace. We are living in the age of grace. The age of grace began when Christ came and died on the cross. We're still in that age of grace. The Bible talks about the ages to come. That would be the age of the redeemed, when we actually go to heaven and live forever in a perfect state. All of these things can be very mysterious to us. Even the mystery of the rapture to come. A lot of people have a hard time believing that the rapture is actually going to happen. That is even 
possible? And there's a lot of questions surrounding the mystery of the rapture. 1 Corinthians 15, 51 says, Behold, I show you a mystery, Paul writes. We shall not all sleep, but we shall all be changed. I tell you, I can't explain it to you how all the bodies are going to come up out of the grave that has been laying there for hundreds and thousands of years and they're going to be made perfect and reunited. And what about those who are cremated? And what about those who are buried at sea? And what about those who got blown to bits in a war? And what about this? And what about that? It's a mystery, but I believe God is God. Amen? I don't care what the mystery has to show me. I just know the one who can solve all mysteries. And who has the answers to all these things that we have in our mind. I have the hope of glory. Amen? I have the hope in a God who lives. I have this hope that one day all things will be perfect. Do you have that hope this morning? That's what I want to encourage you with today. The greatest mystery of all is this hope of glory. It's a mystery hidden from the Old Testament saints. In Colossians chapter 1, where we're at, verse 26 says, Even the mystery which have been hid from ages and from generations, but now is made clear or manifest to his saints. It's the mystery of Christ within the believers, the hope of glory. Again, going back to our verse here. So whom God has made known what is the riches of the glory of this mystery among the Gentiles, which is Christ in you, the hope of glory. This is a wonderful mystery story here this morning. It is the hope of glory. There are three choices for all people in hope. You have three choices this morning in where you place your hope, in how you have your hope. We all have choices, and the Bible gives us these choices. And there are people who exercise certain choices. I want us to look at the first choice that we have. The first choice that many people choose and that they have is something called false hope. Many people who don't believe in God have hope that there is no God. That's what they're hoping for. And that's false hope. Many people who worship a statue, like the church down here down the road with the Buddhist temple that's been set up, they have hope in that what they're doing on behalf and towards that statue is real. That's false hope. I've heard a preacher say one time that you can or one person said that you can believe whatever you, you believe as long as you're genuine. And this preacher said, well, you can genuinely be wrong. You can have hope in something and be genuine about it. Truly believe that it's real. And we talk about that in the Sunday school class of having false realities. Many people can really truly believe that there is no God. They can believe that their way is the right way. They can believe that God's rules don't apply to them. They can believe it, but it doesn't make it so. That's called having false hope that you're okay even though you haven't set yourself right with God. That is a false hope this morning. And the Bible says in 1 Corinthians 15, 19, if in this life only we have hope in Christ, we are of all men most miserable. I tell you, that state has never been more real than it is in 2014. And in this life only, we have hope in Christ that we are of all men most miserable. I tell you, the payoff for living for God is probably not necessarily going to happen in this life. You're not going to see the big payoff for giving your life to God while you're living on this earth. That's what heaven's all about. That's where we're going. Heaven. That's the payoff. You're not just going to have all your problems go away when you get saved. All of a sudden, things aren't just going to get easy for you just because you're a child of God. 
The benefit of being a child of God is knowing you have the God of the universe helping you through these things, helping you to make the right choices, giving you away from your addictions, giving you away from that crowd you feel you can't get away from. If in this life only we have hope in Christ, we are of all men most miserable. False hope is your first option this morning. And you have that right to have false hope. But you have the right to be wrong. Amen? You have the right for false hope. False hope ultimately makes one miserable. Because they know, deep down, they know that what they're believing in is not the truth. And it just makes them miserable because they're deceiving themselves. They are lying to themselves, and they eventually come to realize that. And all that does is it makes us miserable. Some people hope in money. We have a story in the Bible of a rich young ruler. In Luke 18, verse 23, after Jesus told him to sell all he had and give it to the poor and come and follow me, he wasn't saying doing good deeds got you to heaven. He was saying, you've got to get that junk out of your life so you'll be able to follow me. You can't follow God with a beer bottle in your hand. You can't follow God with a needle in your arm. You can't follow God and not get rid of the stuff that keeps you away from God to begin with. That's what Jesus was telling this man. You've got to drop it all, leave it all, and follow me. That's what Jesus was saying. And when the rich young man heard this, Luke 18, 23 says, he was very sorrowful, for he was very rich. He was all about this life only. And his hope was in his riches. His hope was in this life. And if in this life only, we have hope in Christ. We are of all men most miserable. We need to understand that this morning. The rich young ruler came to Jesus, and many are like him today. They make money their God. They make their job, their career, their dreams their own God instead of letting Jesus be God to them. Some people have hope in their intellect and in their abilities. Maybe it's musical talent. Maybe it's something else. They believe that education answers all the needs. They think that they can handle any crisis that comes their way in their life. But I tell you, if you put all of your hope in just that, why? We are as all men most miserable. What is going on with this man? There we go. That was lucky. I tell you, if I had hope in my education, I'd be real miserable today. Because I got an email. <clears throat> I got an email Friday. And this is the last thing you want to get on an email on a Friday afternoon. I opened up the email and said, John, it has been brought to our attention that we have a problem with your teaching licensure and teaching grant. I'm like, oh gosh, they're going to fire me. I mean, Friday afternoon, here I am. We have a new boss, a new superintendent, and all this stuff. And now they got a problem with my education. And what happened is I, I need to have an extra certification to teach drafting. I'm like, God, I've been teaching drafting for the last seven years at Carson High School. Why didn't y'all catch this seven years ago when you hired me? For some reason, it slipped through the cracks. I have a technology education degree, but I had to add on a, a drafting certificate to that degree to make it valid. If I had hope in my education, I lost all hope Friday afternoon when I opened up that email. We don't need to have hope in our own abilities or our own credentials. We need to have hope in God and in God alone. I know God's going to help me with this. I know He's going to walk me through it. Sounds like as if I have time to do something else. Sounds like I need to have to go back to school now. I'm going to have to enroll in a school somewhere, and I've got five more classes that I have to take on top of everything else and pay for this and this and that and the other. So, you know, I could freak out about that. And I could be going, oh, woe is me. But I have hope that God's going to help me. Amen? He's, he's always helped me through it. He's always given me a job. He's always provided. So I'm just going to have the hope that God is going to help me. And that's not false hope, folks. 
That's true hope in Jesus Christ. That's what we call the hope of glory. Some people hope in religious ceremonies or religious rites. Some people hope in their good works to get to heaven. But Christ is risen. Amen? So hope in Him is sure. It's not about our religion. It's not about your denomination. It's not about the baptismal certificate hanging on the wall. It's not about some thing that happened to you. It's something that's real that lives in you today, right now. People who depend on things that happened years ago, I feel sorry for them. I don't depend on my confession in Christ years ago to be my way to heaven. I depend on what I know right now today. I made a confession of faith as a small child. But I came to realize that was nothing more than just a profession of faith that I did one night because someone asked me, hey, you want to go down and get saved tonight? What am I going to say? No. I made a profession of faith. And I assumed after that point that I was saved. But as I lived my life and I got older and I kept thinking and pondering about that, I was like, this is false hope. I'm hoping in something that I don't even know is genuine. And I got that straightened out and I got saved, truly saved by the blood of Jesus Christ. And I now know today, that was back in what, 2001? My wife and I both got saved on the same one, back in 2001. I, I know since then, I know now, years later, I still know it's real. Not because of what happened in that pastor's office, a gospel like Baptist Church, not because I sat down and had that uh, prayer and, and Joe Lowe's says, did you pray that prayer? It's not about praying that prayer. It's about knowing he lives in you right now, years later. The Bible says his spirit will bear witness to our spirit, and we know that we are the children of God. We can know right now. Do you have that kind of hope, or do you have false hope? based on some event that happened in the past. Or false hope, and well, maybe one day I will get saved when it's the, the time is right. That's false hope, because you may never see that day. You may never live to that point. Most people die before they have the opportunity, because they have sinned away their day of grace. They cast it off to the side. Don't have false hope this morning. Don't have hope in your childhood. Hope in an event that happened. Have true hope that Jesus lives in you right now, today. Hello? Y'all here? Do you have that kind of hope? Do you know he lives in you right now, this Sunday morning? Hello? Let me see if I can find some people in here. Hey, y'all. Do y'all have that kind of hope? If you don't, I'm going to tell you straight up, you might be getting ready to bust their wild. If you don't have hope today, and if you don't know today that you're saved, you might not be. And you've got false hope in that God will let you into heaven anyway. God ain't that kind of God. God is a just God. Yeah, He's a loving God. He's a merciful God, but He's a just God. And the Bible says when it's all said and done, that whosoever His name is not written in the land of the life will be cast in the eternal land of fire. That's Bible. If you don't have this hope, you need to get right with God. You need to get saved so you can have real, true hope. Not false hope, but true hope. Before we go there, let's look at one more kind of hope that a lot of people have, and that's no hope. You ever felt like you just had no hope? Um, hospital bills keep coming in. We got hospital bills this weekend. And it's got stuff on there for somebody being in rehabilitation stuff in some place in Charlotte. Now, we haven't even been to Charlotte. Ain't uh, nobody been to any rehab or any time. I mean, I was like, how in the world are we going to pay for this? You know, sometimes, sometimes we feel like we just got no hope. No hope of getting a job. I, I've got this one student. He graduated a few years ago. And he's been to all kinds of interviews. And he's getting to the point. He doesn't really got no hope. He's never going to get a job. He's just... Yeah, he says, I get called in for an interview, and they never call me back. I just, he's losing hope. Some people have no hope. Ephesians chapter 2, verse 12 says this, 
that at that time ye were without Christ, being aliens from the commonwealth of Israel, and strangers from the covenants of promise, having no hope, and without God in the world. That's the way most people are today. They are living in this world without God, and they truly have no hope. I honestly don't know that this student that I have who feels he has no hope in getting a job, I don't really think he's saved. I don't. I've never seen the true evidence of that in his life. And, and I don't know if that's where his lack of hope comes from or not. But I want to tell you, I've been let go before from a really good job. I mean, I had a job teaching out of college. And I taught some semesters only two days a week. And all I had to do was go to work at least one hour a day. And they paid me twice as much as y'all are paid me here. And I was doing what well, felt like next to nothing. I was enjoying it. I was appreciating that. And a new, a new president came in, and the last one was in, the first one was out, and I happened to fit that description, and I lost my awesome, nice, cushy job at community college up in Lane. But I didn't lose hope just because I lost my job. I didn't have no hope. Why? Because I had been saved. While I was working there, actually, I got saved. I had a hope that was really, really strong, and I knew God was going to work something out. Well, he worked it out, and I got a job at China Grove Elementary School, being a computer guy down there, and I got to working in that job and really liking it, and then these, these uh, certification people are about to kill me. These certification people came to me and said, well, you're only qualified to teach middle school and high school. I'm like, I'm not teaching. I'm the computer guy. I fix computers. Well, if you're going to be in the elementary school, you've got to have the right certification, so you've got to go back to school. And I just finished my master's degree because I had to go back to school to get my master's degree to work at the college. Just as the college let me go. And then here I am, I got another job, and they're saying they're going to have to let me because I don't have elementary certification. And I was getting to that point, where I was getting frustrated, but I still had, didn't have a loss of hope. I still knew God was going to work something out. And it was, it was I think, it was either the same day or the next day, I got a phone call from uh, CT Communications. And I saw the phone number coming in, and I was like, who is this? I answered the phone, and I said, who's this? Uh, Mr. Harvey from CT Communications. I said, I think, did we pay a bill? Did we forget to pay the phone bill? What? No, but wait a minute, we don't even have service with them. We have service with AT&T. What are these people calling me for? And they were calling off me not. But I didn't even know I had a flight for I evidently submitted a resume and application online at some point after leaving the college trying to find another job. And right when it needed to happen, God made a way. I had lost hope. I knew he was going to work something out. And he did. Well, guess what? When Windstream took notice of the awesome job we were doing at CTC, they bought out the company, and guess who was one of the first people to get cut from that job? Human Resources, which is where I was in. I was a trainer at the company, and they cut my position there. And then I had to go back and find something else to do. But guess what? We never skipped a meal. You can tell that. We never skipped a meal. We never had to, uh, you know, not pay our bills. God always provides. I've always had hope. But there's a lot of people out there, and maybe you're one of them that just doesn't have hope this morning. There's a lot of people that have no hope. To live without Christ is to die without hope. I'm going to skip this world, because this world is not really what hope is all about. It's about the next world. If we keep our sights on what's coming to the next world, the stuff about this world won't bother us quite so much. Because this is all temporary. This is all just little stuff that we go through to, to show our character, to build our character, to be a witness to others in the places that we're put, so that when we get to the other side, we'll have our rewards there. That's where it's all going to matter. And there's people that live in this life without Christ. And if that's the case, they are living without hope. Hope is truly tested at death. I have sat in many a hospital room and in many a bedroom watching someone die. 
I have seen more people than I want to see take their last breath. That's not, they didn't teach us that in seminary. They didn't teach us how to prepare ourselves for that. And you can never be prepared for that. But I've seen my own family members do that. I've seen church members do that. I've seen other folks die right before my very eyes. And the ones who died with Christ in their heart, it was such a peaceful thing. Now, not every time it's going to be peaceful. I'll testify to that. Sometimes when, when disease sets in, it's not peaceful. But I've seen people die with Jesus in their heart, and I can tell there's a peace about them like no other. If you were to watch someone die without Christ, they knew they weren't saved, that's a whole different story. That's a whole different situation. Because when you're dying without Christ, you have no hope in what's about to happen to you. Or the realization that you're about to bust hell wide open is settling in. And that's a horrible thing to experience, I'm sure. Thank God I'll never have to experience that. I'm saved, amen. I know I'm saved. Are you saved this morning? Do you have that kind of hope? If someone came in here and gunned us all down right now, I know I'd be with Jesus. If Jesus came back in the sky today, I know he'd be coming back to take you with him. Do you have that kind of hope? Or are you one that has no hope? This morning, maybe you do have hope, but you know you have friends and family that don't. Take this message on their behalf. Let that be motivation to go and tell them about Jesus. Our hope is truly tested at death. Earthly successes will be no comfort when that day comes. I was, we're driving up the road this morning and talking about the new iPhone 6. And evidently there's a problem with the design in the iPhone 6. And that you put it in the pocket and the, the case bends a little bit and it breaks the circuitry in, in the, the phone itself. It's causing problems. And I immediately started thinking about what was his name? Steve Jobs. Was his name Steve Jobs? He was the guy that was the advocate and started all that. And I got to think about Bill Gates. And I got to think about all the money that those guys have made in the last 20, 30 years. And the empire, of course, Steve Jobs has, has passed on now. And uh, but I got to think about that. And, and I got to think about this message. Like, you know, you can have the billions and billions of dollars that these people have, all the success in the world, all the, uh, the things that they have had, but if you die without Christ, none of that matters. None of that matters. And from my understanding, Steve Jobs was not a Christian. All the iPhones in the world ain't going to get him into heaven. All the amazing things, I'm using one of his devices right now, this iPad up here. He made some amazing products, and his company continues to make some amazing products. But this stuff don't mean nothing when it comes to your relationship with God. You can have all the success, all the technology, all the know-how in the world, but earthly successes will be no comfort at your last breath. And your last breath could happen at any moment. I never dreamed when I was teaching my first Bible history class that at the end of that semester I would be attending the funeral of one of my students. And she didn't know that I knew. She was just driving home one afternoon and got T-boned by a truck and killed her on the side of the road. You never know when it's going to happen. So don't plan to do it later. We've got to get our hope situated now. Don't get comfortable with just the things of this life. There are contrasts of hope at death. The Bible says in 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, verse 13, Now would I have you be ignorant, brethren, concerning them which are asleep, that ye sorrow not, even as others which have no hope. I say death is the point where you really realize your hope is real or it's false. Do you truly, and think about that. I want you to think about it. Nobody likes to think about dying. But I want you to think about dying today. If you die right now, do you know you would be in heaven? If you don't know that for sure, you have false hope or no hope. But you can have true, pure hope of glory. You can have the hope that Jesus can save you and that he'll take you to heaven with you. If you've got that hope, awesome. What about your family members? 
What about your friends? What about your neighbors? Do they all have this kind of hope? I tell you, if I learned a secret in life that just made me just happier than a pig in mud or however the phrase goes, I'd want to share that with somebody so they would experience that happiness too. If you've got that kind of hope in God and you know someone who does it, what's keeping you from sharing that with them? They want to know. They need to know. Comfort at death is only for believers. Unbelievers borrow Christian comfort many times. They'll lean on us for how we would get through it, but they themselves don't know what it's really all about. They have no hope. It says having no hope and without God in the world. Does that describe you this morning? Does that describe someone you know this morning? There are no promises of hope for those who die in unbelief. If you die without Christ, you're going to hell. That's all there is to it. All you've got to do, though, is confess Jesus to be your Savior. And you can have this last one called the hope of glory. Going back to our main passage of Scripture. To whom God would make known what is the riches of the glory of this mystery among the Gentiles, which is Christ in you, the hope of glory. Christ in you, the hope of glory. It's not hoping for glory, it's the hope of glory. That you are glorified in Christ Jesus because of who He is. Because that Jesus lives. Hope is here. And it is a confident expectation of what is to come. That's true hope. That is the hope of Glory. G. Campbell Morgan says this, it does not mean foundationless expectation, but rather confidence in something. What is the reason for the confidence in Christ Jesus? Why do we believe in Jesus Christ? Why do you believe in Jesus Christ this morning? Y'all have it. Scott, why do you believe in Jesus Christ? He saved you, he saved you. How do you know that's true? He knows it in his heart. Joy, why do you believe in Jesus? Because he died on the cross for your sins. Man, why do you believe in Jesus? Because of the evidence of the blessings. Why do I believe in Jesus? Because he lives. And because He lives, He can give us all these things. He can give us hope. He can give us a family. He can give us promises. We can feel Him in our heart. Because He lives. Jesus is the only religious leader who has ever risen from the dead. That's how we believe in Jesus. That's how we know He lives. That's why we can have hope in Him. The resurrection brings living hope. 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 3 says, blessed, is, blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, which according to His abundant mercy hath begotten us again unto a lively hope by the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. Because He lives, we can live. And because we saw Him live, there is evidence, it's documented, if you don't believe what's written down, go to His tomb today. Guess what? He ain't in there no more. Amen. Go to Buddha's tomb. He's still in there. Go to Muhammad's tomb. He's still in there. Go to all these other dudes' tombs. They're all still in there. But Jesus' tomb is empty. That's proof that He lives. And that's where our true hope comes from. Glory is ahead for even us sufferers here on earth. Romans chapter 8, verse 18. For I reckon, Paul must have been a Timothy read that. I reckon, he says, for I reckon that the sufferings of this present time are not worthy to be compared with the glory which shall be revealed in us. He's saying it don't matter how bad it gets down here, it's going to be the total opposite of the amazing stuff on the other side when we get to heaven. Do you have hope this morning? I guess that's my question I want to ask you. 
Do you have hope? A lot of people say, well, I'll believe it when I see it. Well, that's not true hope. Romans 8, 24 says, for we are saved by hope. Hope of what? Well, for me, it's hope of living forever with Jesus because Jesus is alive forevermore. That's where my hope is. We are saved by hope. But hope that is seen is not hope. For what a man seeth, why doth he yet hope for? It does all come down to a choice. It does all come down to faith. Either faith that Jesus was real or faith that Jesus was a liar. What do you have faith in this morning? My faith is that Jesus told the truth and that he is the truth and that he did rise from the dead. He didn't just, you know, lay there in a coma for a few days and wake back up as some people speculate. I ask him, I use the Bible against him, I say, what's the oldest person ever to live in the world? Some people will come up with the answer, Methuselah, who was 969 years old. I said, well, I said, if that's the case, then I know Jesus is alive, because if he was just in a coma for those three days and came back out of it, he'd be at least 2,000 some years old today, and I know that ain't the case. He really did die. And he really did raise from the dead. That's where my hope is in. I want to ask you this morning to allow the living Christ to come into your life. I want to encourage you this morning to invite others to ask Jesus to come and live in their heart as well. Are you going to choose false hope today? Are you going to settle for no hope? Or will you choose the hope of glory that is found in the Lord Christ Jesus. Let's stand as we close in a word of prayer.